All right, folks, welcome back to the Fitz News Studios, another edition of your Week in Review. We've got a lot of Murdoch stuff to cover. Yes, the story's still going. I sometimes can't believe it myself, but tons of Murdoch news we're going to dive into, including the first phone call from Alec Murdoch since his incarceration on the double homicide trial, the first recorded call. We got it. We exclusively released it. We're going to talk about the call and its fallout, as well as some other Murdoch-related news, including all the trials that are coming up. In the coming months, we're also going to dig into the story of Gerard Price, the gangland leader, convicted killer whose early release from prison, negotiated by a powerful lawyer legislator against the state's constitution and code of laws, sparked a huge controversy. We've got a special guest in the studio this week who's going to tell you all about that. He's the top prosecutor for South Carolina, Alan Wilson. Stay tuned for an excerpt from our interview with him in this show. And we're going to talk politics. There's a lot of stuff happening on the 2024 front. If you care about who the next president is, some of you do, some of you don't. If you do care, that last segment's going to be one you'll want to listen to. All of that and more heading your way on the Week in Review. So we keep waiting for America to get sick of the Murdochs. It's not happening. It's not happening. And I got to be honest, though, covering this story as long as we have, covering this family, all the cases associated with it, all the filings, all the charges— Criminal, civil, state, federal, you name it. It's a lot. And we get Murdoch fatigue at times, I think. But apparently that is not an issue for the rest of the country because, again, there's a huge, huge market for this story. We see it just this week. Fox Nation has announced that it's launching a new documentary series related to the Murdochs. And this, again, follows Netflix, follows HBO Max, follows Investigation Discovery, follows all of the networks running huge stories on this family and this just Southern Gothic tragedy. But this week, we are covering, again, the aftermath of the big double homicide trial from back in March in Walterboro, South Carolina, where Alec Murdoch convicted of killing his wife and younger son, Paul Murdoch. Now, Murdoch after being convicted, was sentenced to two consecutive life terms in prison. Obviously, his attorneys are appealing that sentence. We've written a bit about that, talked about that at at some length on on this show and on FitzNews.com. But Murdoch, since that sentencing, has been an inmate of the South Carolina Department of Corrections since March the 3rd of 2023, when he was again sentenced to those consecutive life terms. So Murdoch was first sent to Kirkland Correctional Institution, which is an intake center, It's in Columbia, South Carolina. It's a center where all new inmates are sent for evaluation. After about a month at Kirkland, Murdoch was transferred to his permanent location within the South Carolina Department of Correctional System. And again, we don't know officially where that is. We've heard rumors where it is. We have opted not to really dive too much into that because we want to respect SCDC and their confidentiality and their safety, trying to protect other inmates, trying to protect Alec Murdoch. But What's he doing in prison? That's a, a, a lot of people have asked that question. And so over the last few months, we've gotten a few glimpses at Alec Murdoch's life behind bars. And we have seen that he gets a lot of communication from the outside world, reporters, news editors, a lot of admirers, a lot of particularly female admirers. And so this past week, we received the latest, I guess document dump is what you want to call it, but the latest batch of information Responsive to our Freedom of Information Act request, and I want to really quick single out Jen Wood, our research director. In addition to doing amazing Murdoch reporting, Jen Wood is doing amazing Murdoch research work. She is sending out tons of FOIAs on this case, but also a ton of other cases. We'll talk about some of those in a bit. But SCDC, Department of Corrections, sent back a bunch of information this past week related to the Murdoch FOIAs that we submitted. And for the first time, in addition to a bunch of messages, in addition to a bunch of call logs, we actually got the first calls. Now, Murdoch has been making calls behind bars. He's been using a prison-issued tablet to make calls, uh, uh, to have some music access, to watch some movies. And again, this isn't special treatment. All inmates in the SCDC system are given a tablet. Apparently, the correctional officials believe that this helps keep things calm in the SCDC system, which has had a lot of violence over the years, people, a lot of violence. But Murdoch, again, no no. Special preferential treatment here. Every every inmate gets a tablet. But he's been using the tablet for these various purposes. But calls up to this point have been not released, meaning, and we confirm this, that they've been calls between Murdoch and his attorneys, which obviously that's attorney-client privilege. 
the public doesn't have a right to hear any of that conversation because it relates to his appeal and obviously all these other charges he's facing. But one call was released this week. And it was the first time that the public heard Alec Murdoch's voice since the big double homicide trial. And it was the first jailhouse call that we've heard since many, many months ago when, when Murdoch was a, an inmate at the Alvin S. Glenn Detention Center in Richland County, South Carolina. Fitz News, one of the first outlets to get those jailhouse calls way back in 2022, early part of that year. And now we've got the first call from SCDC. Who'd he call? His son, Buster. This call was placed on May the 16th, and we're going to tell you a little more about the context after you hear this call. Here's Alec Murdoch, the first time we've heard his voice since his conviction, talking to his son, Buster. Hey, buddy. Hey, I don't have a whole lot of time. I just boarded a ferry to get back to the Hilton Head Island from the bus. Yeah, I know. I've been trying to call. I was supposed to call you while you were with Jim um, about this meeting. But anyway, um, how about text him and let him know I'm trying to call him? Okay. Did he talk to you about that, about the things that I told him? No, I can't. I can't really understand you either. All right. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna um, I'm gonna leave word with Jim and he'll be in touch with you. Love you. All right. Okay. I'm proud of you. Thanks. All right, so we reported on this call. Obviously, not a hugely significant exchange. It's a 42 second conversation. Uh, painfully awkward there. At the end of it, the "I love you," "I'm proud of you," Buster didn't seem to be having much of that exchange. And who can blame him? Honestly. But it was the earlier part of the call that has apparently generated some, some controversy. So I wanted to address this. We've got this conversation about a meeting. Uh, we've got him talking about a thing. We've got references, obviously, to Jim Griffin, one of his attorneys in the double homicide trial. Actually, the attorney who carried most of the water for Alec Murdoch's defense during that homicide trial. But what were they talking about? Well, it's actually interesting because it ties into what we were just talking about, which was this Fox Nation docu-series, this three-part Fox Nation series that's going to be airing in September, that was the day, that was the day Buster Murdoch actually filmed his interview. And in fact, he's talking about coming from Defusky Island, taking the ferry back over to Hilton Head. That's what they were doing that day. It was not just Buster, it was Harpoolian, it was Griffin, several other Murdoch family members were told, but presenting their side of the story. And they took a lot of grief for this, a lot of grief for this. And I, I got to be honest, I'd I'm not saying one way or the other, but I think they do have a right to tell their story. Certainly Buster has a right to say whatever he wants to say. Now, what did he say in that docuseries? We don't know. We'll have to wait, watch it in September like everybody else. But we do know it was of particular interest to Alec Murdoch what was being said. So this call has generated a bunch of attention. It's in the Daily Mail. It was in TMZ, Fox News talking about it. We got a ton of attention from this call. But it also drew the attention of Griffin, who apparently was unhappy with how this call was covered, with the de description of it as being icy, with some of the characterizations of this conversation. And so Griffin and Sarah Azari, one of the attorneys who's very tight with, with the Murdoch lawyers and the Murdoch family, she will be addressing this along with Griffin on their Presumption podcast this week. So We'll listen to it. We'll check it out. We'll see if there's anything there worth passing along. Obviously, all we did was put the call out there. There was very limited commentary from us. We just put it out there, a few observations, some context. We didn't really weigh in on it one way or the other, but we'll be very interested to see what they have to say. And obviously, people following this story continue to be super interested in every little facet of it. But I wanted to move forward now to the rest of that document dump because we have a great report on FitzNews.com if you want to check it out from our newest team member. Callie Lyons, I want to say a quick shout out to Callie and thank her for her work, both as a researcher and as a byline writer on Fitz News. She's going to be working with Jen Wood, not only on Murdoch stuff, her first story, first byline this week is a Murdoch story, but we're going to have Callie digging on a whole host of stuff. And we're going to mention a few of those things here in a little bit. But as we look forward on the Murdochs, a lot is happening, folks, and we're going to get into that schedule right now. So here's what we're looking at. Obviously, on August 1st, just a few weeks from now, we're going to have the federal sentencing for Russell Lafitte. Now, Russell Lafitte convicted on six federal counts related to his role 
and Murdoch's various financial fleecings of former clients. Lafitte convicted by a federal jury. Now, there was some interesting 11th hour activity regarding that jury, and Lafitte has some, I believe, credible grounds for an appeal. Thus far, no joy for him on that front from U.S. District Court Judge Richard Gergel. Gergel is moving forward with sentencing him. That'll take place on August the 1st in Charleston. Now, two weeks after that, a very important trial, a very high-profile case that has been dominating headlines. And in fact, this is the case that really led to, according to the prosecutors for the state anyway, the double homicide, which led to that huge, again, tragedy down there in Colleton County. And I'm referring, of course, to the wrongful death case filed on behalf of the late Mallory Beach. This is the boat crash case for for those of you who've been following it. It is going to gavel to order. We don't know where yet, though. There's been a a last-minute motion from one of the defendants in that case, the Parker's Convenience Store Empire. They want to move that case out of the 14th Judicial Circuit, away from Hampton County, actually away from any 14th Circuit Court. They want to move that somewhere else in the state, and we believe there's a chance that that request might be granted. In fact, we've been told that there's a possibility that trial could be held in the Midlands region of the state. But again, at this point, we don't know. So right now, as it stands right now, though, August the 14th, that is the start date for that big civil trial in which the a jury will determine ultimately who was liable for the death of Mallory Beach. She again died in a boat crash in February 2019. Paul Murdoch, Alec Murdoch's late son, allegedly piloting that boat at the time that it crashed into a piling at the Archer's Creek Bridge. All the occupants of that boat, according to responding law enforcement officers, were grossly intoxicated. Paul Murdoch charged with multiple counts of boating under the influence. His father implicated in some alleged obstruction of justice in the aftermath of that. Again, FitzNews.com. Just Google FitzNews boat crash. You can learn all about that saga. But that case coming to a head here in the next couple months. The other cases that we're looking at, some Murdoch defendants, I want to talk about these real quick. One of the big ones that we're looking into, the case of Jerry Rivers. Now, we've heard about Alec Murdoch and gang connections. We've seen a lot of questionable calls on Alec Murdoch's phone lines to some folks that, again, Jen Wood, our research director, has identified as having some connections to this Cowboys gang. Obviously, we know about Alec Murdoch's drug issues, but the trial of one of the alleged Cowboy connections, Jerry Rivers, that is also scheduled, also scheduled for this coming month, August 28th in Colleton County. And that's one we need to watch very closely, people, because we all know about the boat crash case if you follow this story. We all know about the Russell Lafitte saga, but this case, this Jerry Rivers case, this could peel back another layer of the Murdoch story because, again, remember, Jerry Rivers is facing a charge of obstruction of justice related to the Murdoch investigation, taking a cell phone from from a a home where a raid was underway in the hopes of ascertaining some of Alec Murdoch's drug connections. So this is big. Do not snooze on that August 28 Jerry Rivers trial in Colleton County. But, again, we're just getting started. We've got a huge status conference that's scheduled for September 11 regarding the financial crimes. Again, Alec Murdoch, he's behind bars, two life sentences, but he is facing more than 100, 100 counts of financial crimes related to, again, stealing millions of dollars from former clients, from former friends, just a host of alleged financial victims. And those charges, again, he's also facing federal charges, but the state is moving forward with its case, and there will be a key status hearing on September 11 related to that. We've also, on September 11, we've got the trial, for now, scheduled for Corey Fleming, one of the alleged accomplices in some of these Murdoch-related financial fleecings. Fleming, if you remember him, you in the trial, he was the guy that was present at Alec Murdoch's third interview with state law enforcement agents when Murdoch was finally confronted with the fact that he lied to law enforcement about his whereabouts on the night of his wife and son's murder. That was a key moment, key moment in the case. And Corey Fleming was there with Murdoch when that meeting was held in Walterboro in 2021. So Fleming's trial, he's facing multiple charges. He's already copped a plea with the feds. So it'll be interesting to see how that impacts. And again, as you've followed this case on Fitz News, you know that state and federal uh, prosecutors 
not been cooperating, not been cooperating. And we have been told that Corey Fleming, in fact, has engaged some new legal counsel in the hopes of improving his position with the state. He's already got a good deal with the feds, but he's trying to get some help with state prosecutors who thus far have been unwilling to work with him. We're going to bring you an update on that hopefully early next week because we believe it'll be a name familiar to our audience, but we'll keep you in, in the loop on that as that moves forward. So that's another case to keep an eye on. And is that it, Dylan? I think we got through the, the whole list there. No, we got one last trial to talk about, and that is Spencer Roberts, another one of these Cowboy Connection defendants. And we talked earlier about the Rivers case that's scheduled for August. This is another one. In fact, it was Spencer Roberts' phone that they were looking for when they made that August raid in Colleton County. And Jerry Rivers took that phone away from the house where they were they were raiding. And by the way, it was a gambling house. So a lot of folks have been wondering, where did Alec Murdoch's money go? If you remember, we did a segment a few weeks ago about gambling being a possible, possible motive, possible uh, uh, ending point for where all those millions of dollars may have gone. So keep a close eye, not only on that Rivers case in August, but on that Spencer Roberts case, which has been scheduled for December of this year also in Colleton County. So just a ton of cases, a ton of charges, civil, criminal. Like we've said from the beginning, folks, it is a web, a web of alleged criminality. Obviously, we've seen some high-profile convictions. We've seen some plea deals. But this case continuing to gather steam and momentum. And as I mentioned, we don't know all the layers yet. We're going to be keeping a very close eye on these trials. Stay tuned to Fitz News for our trial coverage plans as the Murdoch saga rolls on. All right, so if you recall back in April of this year, our news outlet exclusively reported on an incredibly corrupt judicial scandal, one involving a retiring South Carolina Circuit Judge Casey Manning and a powerful lawyer legislator Todd Rutherford. Now, these two got together, some say with the assistance of a local solicitor, he denies that, but they got together and decided that they were going to release a convicted killer and gang leader who had 16 years left on a mandatory minimum sentence. Now, again, you hear mandatory minimum, you think, okay, mandatory. That's a word that means must. And in fact, this 35-year sentence on this gang leader was called a day-for-day sentence, meaning he was supposed to serve every single day of it. But guess what? Guess what? This judge got together with this powerful lawyer legislator, sprung this guy from the custody of the South Carolina Department of Corrections, and it took about a month for people to figure out he was out. Well, when they did, to his credit, the Attorney General of South Carolina, Alan Wilson, pushed hard to get a hearing before the South Carolina Supreme Court, which ultimately decided to revoke this corrupt deal and order the gang leader back into the custody of of the state. Small problem. By that point, the gang leader had bolted. He had bolted, even after warnings from the attorney general that they should keep eyes on this guy and maybe bring him in to hold him before they decided what to do with the case. Yeah, the court didn't do that. He skipped state, and all of a sudden, it's a huge manhunt once the court overrules this corrupt deal. So this past week, we got some good news. Let's start with the good news. Jared Price, who had been a fugitive from justice ever since the court overturned that corrupt early release, was apprehended this week in the Bronx, up in New York. It was an FBI, New York Police Department team. However, they were acting on a tip that came in through the South Carolina Department of Corrections, a a tip line that they had set up there that apparently got the information and the intelligence leading to his apprehension and rearrest. So now what happens? Well, we sat down this week for an exclusive interview with the Attorney General who walked us through a little bit of what's going on in that case as part of a broader discussion on the need to fix the corrupt judicial system that set Price free in the first place. Here's a clip from that conversation. Walk us through a little bit of of what you can tell us about the Jared Price story. Well, I actually argued that case in the Supreme Court. I mean, I was I was that fired up about it because I just saw the injustice in it. Um, let me go back to the initial event. It looked horrible, and I don't think there's anything you can defend about the facts of the case. As to what motivated the judge, what motivated the solicitor, I'm not going to opine on because I'm not back in the room, okay? What I can say is, is that when people see stuff like that, their head goes to the darkest places when, it, you, know, when you talk about influence. It doesn't matter whether or not influence occurred, inappropriate influence, 
uh, occurred or not. People believe that it did. And I want a system that can make it possible for people to say, okay, no matter how something looks, the system wouldn't allow that influence to exist. Right now, our system allows for that influence to exist, whether it actually happened or not. So I'm not going to speak about the motivations of the individuals involved in that. What I will say is, is that all of the rules were broken. There was, there was a, basically a pathway to, to actually have someone considered for early release, and not one single legal requirement in that pathway was considered or even followed and it was all done you know out of the you know out of off out of court it, there, there was no legal documentation of it and we didn't even find out till several months later and that looks horrible and that causes people to question the system and then of course you know what was interesting when I was arguing the case and look I want to say this thank you to the Supreme Court in a majority 3-2 decision for vacating that that order and, and sending him back to prison. And thank God he was caught yesterday without incident, and he's going back to where he belongs. But during, during the arguments, well, I'm not going to say which justice, but one of the justices said, y'all screwed up, and you want us to fix it. Now, I was there as the chief prosecutor of the state to say one of our elected prosecutors didn't follow the rules, and I told that elected solicitor that I was going to say that. I was being very open with him. But the judge was in the room. The judge signed off on everything. This is a senior retiring judge who's, who's presumed to know the law or presumed to know how to pick up a book and read the law that is in the, the, or, the, the draft proposed order. And that judge signed off on everything. And when a judge signs an order, a proposed order that is drafted by a lawyer, that judge is endorsing everything that that lawyer says. And so, you know, I just thought to myself, wow, this just, it re, it underscored under me is that we have no check on the judiciary because they were blaming us completely. Now, yes, the executive branch screwed up in that because the solicitor is a member of the executive branch. But guess what? The judge is a member of the judicial branch, and they screwed up just as bad. And I don't think anyone said anything about the judge that day. Um, and I'm not here to besmirch that, that retired judge. What I'm saying is, is the system failed the Smalls family mm -hmm. uh, and, and let, uh, let a murderer out 16 years early, and it had the law been followed— that person would have never been released. Um, and so that is a separate issue, but it does feed into the mistrust and the distrust that an increasing number of people are coming to me about when it comes to how we elect judges in South Carolina and that relationship with the legislative branch of government. Uh, obviously, we're going to publish the entire conversation that we had with the Attorney General, so be on the lookout this coming week on FitzNews.com for the full interview between myself and Attorney General Alan Wilson as we continue that conversation. All right, so shifting gears, we're going to talk a little politics. A busy week as we look ahead to the 2024 First in the Nation Democratic presidential primary and, of course, the 2024 First in the South Republican presidential primary. Some happenings over the last week that are going to impact those two races. And I want to start first with cocaine at the White House. And there's a, if you follow the Will folks on Twitter, we'll put that up. That's my personal tour. That's where we put things that I'm not allowed to say on Fitz News. So if you want to hear all about what I think about the cocaine at the White House, you can check that account. We've got the clip up there. It's um, very entertaining, but it's a problem for Joe Biden because we keep hearing about the weaponization of the justice system in Washington. And again, as I said on that clip, whatever, whatever your opinions are on the legality of recreational drug use, technically it's illegal. And this notion that you can bring a bag of cocaine into the most secure photographed, recorded, secure area in the world, and nobody knows who done it. I think that's strange credulity, but again, a lot of what we've been seeing out of the American justice system in the last few years, strange credulity, and not just on the Biden side, folks. Equal opportunity here. It's, it's both parties have got some real issues here, and there's going to have to be some real steps taken to restore faith in the integrity of the justice system, not only here in South Carolina, but at the federal level. But Biden, a very bad week for Joe Biden. Again, he's had a lot of bad weeks. If you follow our Palmetto Political Stock Index, which, by the way, beautiful graphic. Every time I say it, I love to pull that up. But if you follow it, it's been a bad, bad couple weeks for Biden, bad couple months for Biden. He continues to struggle. He's way underwater with voters. His disapproval ratings significantly higher than approval, more than 13 percent the last time I checked that 538 index. And similarly, poor ratings for him at Real Clear Politics. So the question 
is will Republicans be able to capitalize on that? And the theory amongst all of the challengers to Donald Trump on the Republican side is that the only way to capitalize on it is not to nominate Donald Trump because Republicans have this conundrum, folks. They've got a runaway front runner in the form of the former president, the 45th president, Donald Trump, pulling huge, huge numbers, all the early voting states nationwide, seems to be a lock for re-election, even though he's been indicted federally at the state level up in New York and additional indictments likely, in that case in Georgia, the election alleged election interference case. So despite all that, though, Trump remains well in front of the field, not only here in South Carolina, but the other early voting states. And so the question becomes, if not him, then who? And for a long time, it had seemed as though Florida Governor Ron DeSantis was, was the guy. In fact, right after the 2020 election, you'll recall DeSantis had all the momentum, and it appeared for a while almost as though Trump were finished. But those indictments pulled him back in, didn't they? Funny how that works. It's almost like... The left wants him to be the nominee. But anyway, as we think about that and as we think about the trajectory of this race, DeSantis has struggled to gain traction. He's had some high points. He's had some bursts of momentum, but he remains well behind Trump in all the early voting states, particularly here in South Carolina, trailing by 20, 25, 30 points, depending on the poll that you see. And the folks that have been plowing money into the DeSantis campaign are getting worried. And they're kind of looking around saying, well, wait a minute, who? Who else is there? Well, who are they looking at first? It's a South Carolina politician, and folks, her name is not Nikki Haley. They're looking at Tim Scott. In fact, there's a slew of coverage. We addressed it on our website just yesterday, Friday, we did a post on it. But a slew of coverage on Tim Scott, U.S. Senator from South Carolina. He's run a very positive campaign. This guy is really... uh, He's the anathema. He's he's the exception to the rule. You've got all these politicians throwing bombs. Scott, for the most part, has been like Mr. Rogers. He's the nice guy in the race. He's happy-go-lucky. He's up with people. I mean, you watch his campaign ads and listen to his speeches, and you literally th- think you're listening to the cast of Up With People. It is happy, happy, joy, joy all the time. And that's a contrast to a lot of the negative ads we've seen. But... Scott's about to face a negative broadside because DeSantis folks released a memo this week revealing that they felt Tim Scott was the biggest threat to DeSantis' current position in the race, which means, according to the folks we spoke with on Tim Scott's side, they believe DeSantis is signaling his political action committee folks to start dropping bombs on Tim Scott. So that positive race we've been talking about, mm, we'll have to see if it holds up as Tim Scott starts to fall under the withering attack of a very, very well-funded DeSantis organization. They've lost a little bit of their core financial support, but they remain very well-funded. And again, Tim Scott is going to have to be ready for that broadside that's heading his way as these campaigns move forward. But Scott wasn't the only one in the news this past week. Nikki Haley had an interesting comment. Again, I I heard this when it happened on the, on the television. I didn't think much of it, but she made a comment in an interview with Neil Cavuto on Fox News. And she was, of course, being grilled again about her on-again, off-again relationship, her contortions when it comes to her relationship with Trump. Uh, she, of course, if you followed Nikki Haley, is kind of stick your finger in the wind. She's Mrs. Weathervane when it comes to Trump based on uh, whether it suits her political needs to like him or not like him. But in this case, she equated her relationship with Trump to her relationship with her husband. And she said, and I quote, I don't love my husband 100% of the time. And I'm laughing a little bit here. Everyone who knows the personal history knows I'm blushing a little bit here. But if you're married, I really am blushing. If you're married, you know that you don't maybe love your spouse 100% of the time. But number one, you don't ever say that. (laughs) You don't ever say that. But number two, in Haley's case, it beg the question, well, if you're not loving your husband 100% of the time, who are you loving the other percent of the time? Well, not me this time, folks. Not me. So I'm going to go ahead and take my name off of that list. But it was an interesting gaffe. And again, I don't think it was anything more than a gaffe. I mean, folks, Haley and her husband, when he deployed last month to go serve over in Africa, and I've given him some grief in the past. But, you know, look, the guy's in Africa serving his country. He's there for a year on a deployment with the South Carolina National Guard. 
Yeah. I mean, there's there's no way that that was anything other than a gaffe because, you know, you watch that ceremony when he was deployed last month. Obviously, a very emotional uh, moment for the whole Haley family there. And, you know, we wish Godspeed to Michael Haley and everybody serving, whether we agree with the the global interventionism. In fact, we vehemently disagree with it, vehemently disagree with it. But that's the fault of the politicians and the warmongers and the leaders. It's not the fault of the folks that get deployed. And so obviously, you know, we'll keep him in our thoughts and prayers as with everybody deployed abroad. And remember, the best way to honor their service is not put them places where they shouldn't be. And if you follow Fitz News, you know we advocate very strenuously for that non-interventionist foreign policy. But anyway, an interesting gap by Haley. We'll see how that moves. Again, keep track of the Palmetto Political Stock Index as we follow the rising and falling fortunes of all these candidates here on Fitz News. Again, we were a political site before, before anything else. So when you want to know what's really happening with the Palmetto polit politicians, with the Palmetto political scene, and the impact on the first and the south primaries, come here. We got you covered. All right, that is a wrap for this week's edition of the Week in Review. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Hopefully I didn't cancel myself there with that Nikki Haley bit, then maybe with the cocaine bit earlier if you clicked on that. Who knows? But as we continue to grow here at Fitz News, I talked earlier in the show about bringing on some new folks. But I also wanted to commend your attention to a new offering. This week, we are launching a brand new podcast. It's called Fitz Files. It's dropping Wednesday, July 19. And I'm very excited about this because if you listen to this podcast, obviously we, we do a bunch of true crime. We've talked a lot about the Murdochs, a lot of the other big true crime stories we cover. But we also sprinkle in a lot of court news, a lot of political news, a lot of just news on other stories that we cover. But if you really want to dive into that true crime component of our coverage, Fitz Files is where you want to go. We're going to be not only talking about Murdoch's, about the Cheer Incorporated scandal, but we've got tons of other just gripping narratives from across the Palmetto State and beyond. I'm talking about the Rose Petal murder up in the upstate, the murder trial of Greg Leon, the Mexican restaurant owner who gunned down the lover of his wife. These are the kind of stories that we're going to dive into super deep detail on Fitz Files. So if you haven't already, go to Apple. Go to Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe today to Fitz Files. It's dropping this coming week, Wednesday, July 19. Don't forget to subscribe today to Fitz Files on Apple or Spotify so that you won't miss a single story.